Okay, today we're going to start on the last two words of 23a. It says, Boy Rabba. I think Hashem that we're able to learn Torah every day. It's a learning. Based in English immediately. I'm not going to be able to learn tonight. I wanted to catch up tonight, but I have some school thing that I have to go to. Okay, Boy Rabba, Rabba asked the question. The Rab Shimon ben Alazar, according to the opinion of Rab Shimon ben Alazar, Rab Shimon ben Alazar was quite strict about the slave going free with his own money or with giving it directly. Slave, he had to give the document to someone else to get for him to go free. According to Rabbi Shimon ben Alazar, Evid Kanani Maushi Asa Shliach le Kabogit Miad Rabbi, can a non Jewish slave make a messenger to be able to receive the document from his master? In other words, he himself is not allowed to, according to Rabbi Shimon ben Alazar, but can he make a messenger to receive? In other words, making the messenger, appointing this uh, proxy, is going to make it worse. Possibly. Maybe, even the maybe we should say that since we learn a verbal analogy from a married woman, how she gets divorced. So, Keisha, so, she is, so the slave should be just like a woman, just like a woman can make a messenger to receive her get, to receive her divorce. So to the slave should be able to, Maybe this is one of these halachas that we learn from, just like we learn that the that the divorce, the divorce is lishma. So too, the deed of manumission has to be lishma, has to be for the sake of this person. So too, we should also learn that you can make a shliach, a messenger, a proxy, an, an agent. Or maybe we should say that a woman she's able to receive the get on her own, so she can also make a proxy. However, shliach, not, uh, so therefore, but a evid, maybe a slave, he can't do it on his own, according to Reb Shimon Ben, Allah, so Reb Shimon Allah says that he can't, can't give it to him because he doesn't have any acquisition. So maybe he can't make a proxy either. That's the question. If a, if an, if a slave appoints someone else to receive the divorce, the, the deed of manumission, for him on his behalf, does it work? In other words, I know it would work if the master would give it to this other person without the intention of the slave. I know the slave would go free. Question if the slave appoints him, does it mess it up? Hmm. That's one way of learning. Tesis has another way, but it's good enough. What's the boy other pasta? After Rab asked the question, he then went and answered it. Says Lala Misha Kiisha that we learn that just like a woman can create a, an agent, make a proxy to to receive her divorce document, so to a slave can also receive his deed of, deed of manumission with an agent. Gemara has a question on this. Well, Ravuna Braid Rav Yeshua, Ravuna Braid Rav Yeshua has, uh, has uh, we quote him because he has this interesting statement. He says, Hani kani shluchi When it comes to a Kohen that's doing a service in the temple, is, he, is the Kohen a, a messenger of the people or is a Kohen a messenger of God? Which one is it? Mm-hmm. What's the difference? The difference is if someone says he prohibits any benefit from the Kohen, so if he's a messenger of the person, of the people, then you can't use this coin to be your uh, to, to bring the sacrifice for you. If he's a messenger of God, then you're not benefiting from the coin, 
It's just uh, God's benefiting from the Kohen. He's working for God, not for you, right? It when uh, when you give it to the Kohen, is it now in the in? Is it is it now being worked on by a continuation by you, and it's just through your agent, the Kohen, or is it already getting handed over to God, and it's and and the Kohen is an agent of God. Yeah, who appointed the coin? Is it the people or is it God? The hill says Hashem appointed the coin. Why? Because he, Hashem said that the coin are the ones that should do it. But that doesn't mean that Hashem just said who you should appoint. It doesn't mean he appointed. But who should you appoint, right? Okay. So that's his, that's his question. He gave qualifications. He gave qualifications of who you should appoint. Doesn't mean he appointed it. So Hani Kani Shlucha de Rachmananin. Rafuna Bidir Vishua says that they're agents of Hashem, not yours. These Al Kadaita Shlucha did done in or if they would say, if you would say that your agents, he has a logical proof. Mika Midi Dananli Matsinan Matsina Navdinan Vinu Matsyavdi. Is it possible that there's things that you can't do, but your agent is able to do? So if you can't bring the sacrifices. So how could your agents bring the sacrifice? The agents are just secondary to what you're able to do. It's what the uh, parents tell the kids when they say, um, you have to learn how to clean. If they say, no, I won't. I'm going to have a cleaning lady when I'm old. It's going to be fine. So they'll do everything for me. So, yeah, but they can only do uh, what you what you tell them to do. They can't do anything better than, than that. So anyway, that's a <laughs> that's a marshal. Um, so over here, how could they? How could the Kohenim be your agent if you're not able to do it? So it must be that the Kohenim are agents of of Hashem. Okay. Now, just let's finish the question. The loy is that really good logic? But what about the slave? The slave, he is not able to receive his own deed of manumission. But nevertheless, he can create an agent to receive for him. There goes the whole logic. The Punabedi logic was, obviously the Kainim are agents of Hashem, because if they're agents of you, then you can't do it yourself. How can you make an agent? It must be the agents of Hashem. Turns out that that's not 100% true, because... We have a, a slave that can't receive the deed of manumission on his own, but he can make an agent that can receive it for him, even though he can't receive it on his own. The Gemara says, Valahi. That's not a good question. Because Yisrael, it's not that the Yisrael is not allowed to do it. Yisrael has no connection to it. He never does a sacrifice. Eved, Shaykh, Begitin. But an Eved is Shaykh, is related to the concept of deeds of manumission, why the Tanya? Take a look at this. A slave can receive not his own document, but he can receive a document on uh, for his friend, which means that a slave can receive a document. So if he can receive a document, not for himself, but he can receive a document, then he can also make an agent to receive a document. So it has to do, making the agent doesn't mean that you have to be able to actually do it. It means you have to be involved in it. Some association to it. So here, even though you can't actually do this, receive this uh, this um, deed of manumission, but nevertheless, you're able to receive a deed of manumission on behalf of someone else, you can also, that's enough to be able to make an agent. Okay. Any question? Hello. Huh. Uh, probably learn from one another, but uh, it has a kidney later. Yeah. Okay. The, we mentioned that according to the sages, um, sages said that uh, a slave can use his own money to free himself. As long as the money is not, he can free himself on his own with money, as long as the money is not his own money, as long as it came from someone else. Okay, Rameer argued. Rameer said that 
a slave can't free himself with money, a slave can only free himself with the document by receiving his own document. And Chacham said exactly the opposite. Chacham said that someone else needs to receive the document. Um, was that the opinion of the Rabbanan? No, that was, according to Rabshim ben Allah, so we said that, that um, someone else needs to receive the document, but um, according to them, Okay, this gets confusing because the Gemara switched everything on the last page. Okay, let's see what happens here. It says, um, we know that, yeah. Would Rabbi Mayer agree that a slave can give money to his, his master and then the master in response writes the star? Would he accept that? Yeah, the question is, which um, which mode of, of, of uh, emancipation is he using, the money? or the document. If according to the mayor, um, it would be the money. He was already free before he gets the document, right? So the mayor says he can give money. Okay, right? well, mayor, I, th I thought Rabbi Mayer said he, he couldn't sorry. give any money on his own. Uh, Rabbi Mayer says that, you, I'm sorry, you're right. The mayor says that you can't give money and you would, so according to the mayor would be the document that would be the actual uh, mode of... of uh... So it's just the additional step. He's not arguing about that final step. Yeah. No, I'm, trying to understand the real, I'm trying to understand the real point that Rabbi Mayer is making, because if he can give money to his master and say, and in return, I want my freedom and a document that says I'm free. Right. right. That's okay with Rabbi Mayer, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. But according to the Chachamim, once he gives the money, he's free already. He's free already. Okay, thank you. Uh, there is a point of the document. Let's see soon. Okay. It goes like this. Um, let's say that the Machlekes Reb Meir and the Chachamim is the following. The Reb Meir, Sabar Meir, holds in Kinin Levit Blei Rabbi. This is sort of how we explained it in the Mishnah. That once the slave is given money, it automatically goes to the master. And the slave on his own can't acquire anything. Then we throw in this other concept, which is very similar, that this would, that a woman can't acquire anything without her husband. That means if you give something to a woman or if she finds something, it automatically goes to the husband. Goes to the husband. Exactly like the slave. The slave is given something, it goes automatically to the master. Rabbanan Savri, the Rabbanan hold. No, the opposite. A slave can acquire. And a woman can acquire without her husband, which would mean that the woman can give her husband, that I'm sorry, the slave can give um, money to the to the master and he can get, gets himself free with his own money. I'm a rabba, I'm a rabba, says, rabba says the name of Rabshesh. We're going to have Rabba and we're going to have Rabba Lozer. Rabba Lozer is in Eretz Yisrael, Rabba is in Bavo. Uh, approximately the same time. Um, Rabshesh, uh, rabba says the name of Rabshesh. Kuli Alma, in Kenya, Levit, Blay Rabbi. Actually, what's going on here is that everyone holds. The slave does not acquire anything without the master. And a woman can't acquire anything without her husband. That means automatically goes to the husband. So why, how, why do we have a machlekes here? Why do the chachamim say that the slave can use money to free himself? We're talking about someone else gave him $100. And he said to him, he made a condition. He says, I'm giving you money, but on condition that your master doesn't acquire it. The mayor says, when he says acquire it, he says it's too late. He says here, as soon as he says here, take it, automatically the master already got it. And then when he throws in a condition, he didn't, he, that's nothing. The condition is nothing. The master got it already. Rabbanan Savri Kimandam Ram Manas Ahani Leitina. The Rabbanan hold that the condition works. The question over here, the the Machlekes Reb Meir and the Rabbanan, is if Al Manas works that the master shouldn't acquire. Rabbi Lazar Amar Rabbi Lazar says Kol Kei Gavna Kol Yal Malei Pligi. Everyone would agree the Kani Avid Kani Rabbe that the master already got it, like which was the opinion of Reb Meir before. But Achim Ayaskin and here the Machlekes is slightly different. Kegain the Akn Leyechan Manav Amal Al Manas Shetetz Be Lecheres. Someone's giving money to the slave and saying, I'm giving this to you on condition that it works to get you free. Rameir Sava, Rameir holds camera like Kani, as soon as he tells him that I'm giving to you, Kani Avadu, Kani Rabbi, it's automatically given to him. 
and the master got it. So automatically the master's. When he made that condition that it's only to get you free, we ignore that condition. He never even gave it to him. He only gave it to him to get free. If he doesn't go free, then it's not his. He told him, I'm only giving this to you on condition that it gets you free. Okay. Um, which means I'm giving it to you so that you give it to the master and then the master will get, will, will, um, will uh, let you free. This is a, um, the parents give the kids money to go to yeshiva. This is for, you know, to get new shoes. You know, or something. this is for the cleaners. Or something. Then, what's the halacha, by the way, uh, Naftali? You give someone something and you tell them that I'm giving this to you for this and this. Is the person obligated to use it for that or is it already his? I remember halacha, something. Well, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I know that you can limit the purposes for which a gift is given. You can, you can yes. You, you, I know you can exclude. Like we uh -huh. talked about yesterday, you can say, I'm giving you this gift. And it is not to be used to repay your loan. All right, right. And the right. the lender has to respect that. Right, right. But uh, I don't I don't know about the. Question. I remember something in Shulchan Aruch. He said he, someone gives someone else and it's uh, something someone else, and he says this is supposed to be used for Shabbos for for food for Shabbos. So you give him something like that that has a specific intention. Was the is does the person have to keep the uh, that requirement that he gave him? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't remember. Okay. Rami The word Rami means to throw. We're gonna throw a Reb Meir against Reb Meir, and we're gonna throw a Rabban against the Rabban. So we're gonna see a contradiction here because Reb Meir said that the stipulation is meaningless and it automatically goes to the master. And the Rabban said, no, the stipulation it works and the master doesn't require it. So the Tanya was taught in a Brisa. We switched topics, but it's actually the same logic behind it. Ain Isha paid the Maisa Shani Belichem Shman, top of page 24. A woman, when it's coming to redeeming Maisa Shani, Maisa Shani was the tithe that's brought to Jerusalem. Now it could get very heavy because if you want to bring all the produce, that's going to be a big, a big deal. So you can redeem it for money. Now, when you deem, when you redeem your own Maisa Shani, you have to add one fifth onto the price. One fifth means you divide it by four and you throw one of those uh, quarters on top. That means now you have five, that's the fifth. So it, let's say a woman is redeeming my Sushani. So it says, she, she automatically has to pay the fifth. Why? Because she's redeeming her husband's my Sushani, and the money that she's using to redeem it belongs to the husband. So it's basically the husband that's redeeming it. So she has to add the fifth. Don't make it, uh, you know, no, no tricks over here as if, no, it's not my money. It's in my wife's name. It's his money. It's his. Okay. Reb Shem ben Elazar, I'm Mishim Reb Meir. Reb Shem ben Elazar says name of Reb Meir. Isha paid the Maishu Shani Belei Chaymish. That a woman can redeem can redeem the Maishu Shani without adding the fifth because the woman is not the owner, uh, because the woman's not the owner of the Maishu Shani and the husband's not the owner of the money. So it's two independent parties here. Now that directly contradicts um, what we what we said before, because we said before that a woman, according to her mayor, a woman can acquire anything without the without the husband. So automatically, the the money belongs to the husband, and the ma'aser belongs to the husband. And here, the mayor says the opposite. Here, the mayor says that the money belongs to the woman, and the ma'aser belongs to the husband. Anyway, let's go through the case. Hey, dummy, what's the case in there? Ilema bezuzi debala ma'aser debala. We talking about that the money is the husband's, and the ma'aser is also the husband. The woman is doing something just on behalf of the husband, so obviously you have to pay the fifth. It must be the case is that it's her money in his miser. And nevertheless, um, what we're seeing is that the woman is able to, at least according to the mayor, it's, uh, it's independent. Umar says that's impossible because Isha Marachman of Isha. According to the Chachamim, how could you say that according to the Chacham that the woman has to pay the extra fifth? We have a Pasik that says, Vimgal Yigal Ishmi Maisrai, Kamishi Sayyasibalov, that only the man, only a man would, would give the fifth. 
Okay, the Gemara is learning that this means that not a woman that's doing it on behalf of her husband. Elalav ki ay gavna must be the case. Da'akne le'achamana must mean that someone else gave the wife money. Bamala and the person said, "Al menashe tifti bayas ha'maiser." I'm giving you this money on condition that you redeem your husband's maiser. Now, is it considered her money, or is it considered the husband's money? Can she can she acquire it without her husband acquiring it? The problem is vip chashamina lehu the two. Opinions that we had in the, in, the, in our in this brisa here that we're quoting are exactly the opposite of the opinions that we had in our Mishnah. According to the Mishnah, Reb Meir would hold that the master acquires it automatically. According to this brisa, we're talking about that the woman acquires it, and she could redeem without paying the fifth. And the opposite, according to the Chachamim, in our Mishnah, this the slave acquires the money and not the master. And over here, we're saying that the husband owns the money and not the woman. And we we put the, all of those opinions together, so there's a clear contradiction. Amar Abaya Epa. Abaya says, we can resolve this contradiction. You know what you do? You take an eraser and you erase the names on the brisa and you just switch the names. Where it says Rabbanan, you put in Rab Meir. Where it says Rab Meir, put in the Rabbanan. And then you resolved it. Rav Amar Rav says, no, I don't want to do that. Rav says, don't switch those names around. We got the case wrong. What we'll do is, we'll, we'll re-explain the case. What's the case? We're talking about not that the husband only owned the miser. We're talking about that the woman owned the miser. She got it from her father. The miser came from her father's house. The question is, who owns the money? And now Rameyer follows his reasoning. Who owns Meiser Shani? Is Meiser Shani considered yours? This is a Gemara in, uh, in uh, Hazav from Matsya. Who owns Meiser Shani? Can a man that takes Meiser Shani, Yerushalayim, take the, the produce and give it to a woman and say, uh, with this, you're betrothed? Is it his? Or is it just there to eat? Is he just taking it to eat, or is it his? Can he do can he do something like that with it? Well, um, the mayor holds that it's mom and hectish. The mayor holds that you don't own it. So therefore, if she brings Meiser into the family because it came from her an inheritance from her father, so the husband doesn't own it because no one owns it. It belongs to Hectish. You just have the rights to eat it. When you go to someone's house, you eat at the table. It's not like you own it. It's uh, you can't take it out. You eat, you eat there, right? You go to a wedding or something. It's not like you can walk home with the food while they were going to serve it. So you go to the to Yerushalayim and you eat, uh, and you eat my sashini. You're eating at Hashem's table. So this is Hashem's table. So it's not really yours. So therefore, the woman that had the my sashini, it's not really hers. That her husband should now say, now it's mine. She was able to eat from uh, from Hashem's table. So therefore, when she has money which really belongs to her husband. That money, which is the husband's, is redeeming her Meister Shani, which means that there are two separate, uh, two separate owners here, which means you don't have to add the fifth. That was Ramey's opinion. You don't have to add the fifth. However, the Chachamim hold, the Rabbanon hold, the Tamayo, they follow their reason. They mom and head you to. They say that Meister Shani belongs to the, the owner, the people that, the person that brought it. So therefore, it belongs to the woman. Belongs to the woman means that now belongs to the husband. The money also belonged to the husband. So therefore, according to the Rabbanon, the Kani Leibal, the, the husband now owns it, Hilkach Shlichus of the Balkav, that therefore when she redeems the Maishr Shani, she's using her husband's money with her husband's produce. So according to that, she needs to add the fifth. It, it, it is designated. Right. right, right, right. That's that's how that's how it would work. No, because once you bring it to Yerushalayim, it's already been designated. You had to designate it back at home, and then like, you don't take your whole field to Yerushalayim. You take only one tenth. One tenth means that you designated one tenth, and you bring it to Yerushalayim, or you change it for money and bring it to Yerushalayim and change it back. Are you 
um, well, that's what we're saying here, that not necessarily. Money it would, would, that the wife has would, pro would go to the husband, probably. But this produce that belonged to the, um, belonged to the wife doesn't necessarily go to the husband because it wasn't really the wife's, it was really Hashem's, according to Reb Meir. Tana. It's taught in a... Actually, this Tana means that it was in our Mishnah. Usually it was taught in a Brisa, but here it means our Mishnah. The Mishnah says that a, uh, a slave goes free Mishnah further. The slave goes free. Uh, where is this? Where do we say the slave goes free? Bashain Ba'ayan. Um, I'm not sure. Okay. It says that the slave goes free if if the uh, master knocks out his tooth and his eye. Or, or tooth, or an eye, or any other limb that doesn't uh, that doesn't return. It means it cuts off a finger or something, something like that that won't grow back. The Gemara says like this: We understand why it says tooth and eye because ksivi that says in the pasuk. How do you know if it's a finger or a toe or something like that? How do you know that that's also going to set the slave free? Right, slave goes free by one of these injuries. Gemara says, "Do me the same vayin." It's comparable to. It's called a mamatzino, or, or in uh, Rabbi Shmuel we call it a binyanav. Same thing. A, uh, we we find a precedent. We have a uh, uh, a, a law, and from that law we'll learn to any other case that's similar. And that goes like this: that mashin vayin mum shabagalav in just like a tooth and an eye are visible. I guess the two teeth are usually visible. Uh, tooth and the eye are visible and they don't return. They don't grow back. The eye doesn't grow back. The tooth doesn't grow back. Also, uh, any sort of injury that won't grow back and it's, re and it's open, so that will also set the slave free. Maybe we should say, Every interesting rule. It says like this, that if you want to use a binyanav, you want to use a a um, precedent. So it can only be that the Torah gives us one precedent in the Torah, but not two. Because if it gives you two, then obviously the Torah is not relying on that one and it had to give you a second one. Now, why did it do that? Because it doesn't rely on the precedent. So if you, anytime you have two sources in the Torah for something, you can't learn from that to anything. If you have one source in the Torah, then that is a good precedent. Well, that detail is not in. Yeah, Shnei Suvim. No, that don't, that's only two verses that contradict each other. But but um, but this is another not one of the rules that's not in that uh, chapter. But you, what maybe the tooth is one precedent and the eye is another precedent, and now you can't learn from it. Umar says Shricha. It's not really two separate rules because each one of those is necessary. If one of them wasn't necessary, then we would say that we couldn't learn from the. We can't learn. We can't use it as a precedent. But because each one is necessary, why are they necessary? Because if it would say only that if it knocks out a tooth, the slave goes free. I could have even thought a milk tooth. A milk tooth means a baby tooth. They call it, and I think in, in Spanish, is it called a milk tooth? In the Gemara, it's called a milk tooth. In, in English, we call it a baby tooth. Do we get it? Yeah. So um, well, we would have thought that if someone knocks out a baby tooth, the slave goes free. And the truth is that the slave doesn't go free from if, it, if, the, if the master knocks out his baby tooth. 
he pulls out his wisdom teeth. Uh, if he knocks it, and you only get one set of wisdom teeth. Eh? If he, but if he knocks out a baby tooth, then you don't go free because it, it grows back. So if it would have only said the tooth, I would have thought that maybe a baby tooth as well. So if it would have said the eye, if it would have said an eye, I would have thought only something that was born that was with the baby at the time of birth, but not a tooth. So it has to tell me eye and tooth. If we only say the tooth, I would have thought even a baby tooth. Let's say I, I would have thought not a tooth because the tooth only comes later. So tzricha, it's necessary to say both. And therefore, we can use that as a precedent for all other injuries that are opened and that you don't grow back. The Gemara has a question. Let's try another problem here. Let's try to say that it's a klalaprat. This is one of the rules in the 13th. David. David, in the 13, Klalopra, a general and a specific. That was one of the, so let's say that it says a man hits, okay, that's very general. He says a tooth and eye, okay, that's very specific. The rule is, if you have a general specific, then it means we're only talking about those specific ones. And there goes what you just wanted to say, that any other of the limbs, fingers or, or toes or something like that, and the nose, if he, he knocks off the one of those, that he should go free. It's not true. It should only be uh, it should only be Shane Vayan, tooth or eye. The Gemara says, Lachafshi Yeshalchenu Chaser Klal Klal Prat to Klal Yet to Dan El Kena Prat Ma Prat and First Mum Shabgalay Vena Chaser Af Kol Mum Shabgalay Vena Chaser. But since it says that for freedom he sends him, that means that which is a general statement, right? It's also not saying another limb. Another, it's another, it's a general statement that he goes free. So that's coming to tell me that it's a klala prat, a klala, general, specific, and general. Over there, it changes the whole story. Over there, what we do is we include everything that's similar to the specific. What is the specific? That it's something that's open, tooth or eye, everyone can see. And it also doesn't grow back. So to any of those limbs that are open and they don't grow back. Mars says, one second. Um, those things affect the way he he works, which doesn't have to mean actual work. It means it will f- affects his uh, his uh, his function. And it also doesn't grow back. And also anything that affects his functioning, which means like the eye he can't see or the tooth he can't chew. But Alamatanya, why was it taught in the Brisa? If he pulled on his beard or and he dislocated his jaw, if it's going to, the, the slave can go free. Then I was like, the jaw, the chin would also, but now what, how does that affect his ability to chew? He can still chew. I'm not sure exactly how he chews without a jaw. But um, why are you saying jaw? What is the etzim that's attached to the beard? Why is that actually attached to the beard? Talash bezikne vidildal by etzim. That means Talash bezikne means you removed his beard. And what happened? How did you pull his beard and and uh, and and re- and dislocate a bone? You Probably the jaw, right? Pulled out the beard and dislocated a bone. Is there not two cases? No. No, if you pull out his beard, he doesn't go free. Or, or dislocated a jaw? No. What is H? This apparently refers to the dislocation of the lower jaw by pulling out his beard right. or uh, or by delivering a sharp blow to the area. Right. 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 You, you don't go free if you pull out his beard. The beard goes back. So you have to knock off his right. jaw. So... So if you dislocate the child, it also goes back. Oh, so that we're saying okay, we're saying over here that Rashi says we're talking about where it doesn't go back. Um, it, it's it going to end up going to going to be um, to what's it called when it just dies and falls off. Okay. Um, so the question is that, uh, but it doesn't somehow. I don't know. I'm not sure exactly, but somehow it's not affecting his function. So why should he go free? 
Yeshalcheno, the Gemara says, what we're going to do is we're going to say over here a little different. We're going to say that Lachavshi Yeshalcheno Ribuyahu, that instead of doing a Klal of Prataklal, we're going to do a Miut Ribuy, a Riba Miut Riba. Remember, we had that from Rabbi Akiva. That's a little different than Rabbi Shmuel. We're going to do it like this. We're going to say that if you have a, a inclusion, an exclusion, and then an inclusion, you include everything except for one thing. So, but if you're including everything, then I feel we call let's see, you bang him on his hand and his hand shrivels up, but it's going to, re, it's going to recover. Maybe that should be the same thing if it's including everything. Bang him on his hand and it uh, shrivels, it dries, and but it could heal. Uh, why, did, why is it taught that he doesn't go free? If you included everything, it should also apply. So what is the exclusion doing? It must mean we're excluding anything that that uh, that will heal. Okay. All of these type, all of these types of limbs, the toes and the when, fingers. Sorry, yeah. when, when he says shane the iron, those aren't the same second. Are they learning a double call call or double so there's only one going on. What do you mean, Shane the Iron? Shane is in its own process. Shane of the Iron. Doesn't say Okiyaka is in of the? No, it's Abda in Amasa. Oh, oh, oh yeah, Amasa. That's what it is. Yeah, okay, ish. Let me see the second over there. What does that say? Either way, I guess it's doing. Um, it's using the details. It's using the pratim maybe from two different sukkim. Then it's going back to the plot. So the, the riba, the riba. It's See, from two different sukkim. And two different sukkim, and the prat is really two pratim and two different sukkim. Yeah, well, and there's only one claw. Yeah, I don't know. And let, let me see the sukkim on the side of your gemara. Okay. They don't bring the Pasuk over here for Shane. Where is the Pasuk in for Shane? Is that in, uh, in Mishpatim? Maybe it's only using um, the Pasuk of Ayin and Shane is just being mentioned because we learn also from Shane certain details that 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 um, we learn from Shane that even if it wasn't born, if it wasn't uh, the Ikaliman, I guess, is the Ayin. The Shane tells me that that even if it came later, right, it wouldn't make sense. What other body part comes later? Nothing, but that that that's why it's not the significant Lima. Only teaching me the shame. Right. It's under a banan. Start in a brace to bakul maybe. Bakul. Um, all of these limbs. Every day it's bem lecheres. A slave goes free. But tzarech gets shichra. Now you also besides that he goes free automatically. But in order for him to get married, he also needs the document. Different Reb Shimon. That's what Reb Shimon holds. Reb Meir Reb Meir Tzarech Meir says you don't need a document. You knocked out a tooth or an eye or a limb. He's free automatically. He can even get married already. Rabbi Eliezer, I married Tzarech. Rabbi Eliezer, is this Rabbi Eliezer? I assume it's, actually, it's hard to assume anything here. Yeah. Could be Rabbi Eliezer. Rabbi Eliezer, I Tzarech. Rabbi Eliezer says he needs, Rabbi Eliezer means Rabbi Eliezer ben Shemua, the friend of Rabbi Meir, Rabbi Shimon. He says that he does need, just like Rabbi Shimon. Rabbi Tarfan, I married Tzarech. Now we're going back a generation. Rabbi Tarfan says that it's not necessary. Rabbi Kiva, I met Tzarech. Rabbi Kiva says it is necessary. Those that would decide in front of the sages, they said near Divra Tarfin. They said they want they liked Rib Tarfin's view. Rib Tarfin says that you don't need the document. You don't need the document by the tooth and the eye because that it says in the Torah. What do you need more than what it says in the Torah? You have the Torah as your document. And the words of Rabbi Akiva by the other limbs, because that's such a fine that's imposed by the sages. The Gemara says, Knasu. You call that a fine? They learned that from the verses. That's not a fine. That was derived from the verses. 
but because it was derived by the sages, so that we should say that you also need a, a document. And also it's not clearly in the Torah, it's only the derivative. My time at the Reb Shimon, what's the reason for Reb Shimon that holds that you need a document? We learn a verbal analogy from a woman. Just like the woman needs a document to leave, that means a divorce. So to a slave needs a document to leave, which means a deed of manumission. Reb Meir, what does Reb Meir say? He says that you don't need the document for the slave. If it would say, then you're right. He sent out. She's, uh, the slave is sent out free. So first you send with the document and then go free. Like you said, but now that it says freedom before the word, that means that the freedom comes automatically. That's the way Ramir is learning it. That the freedom comes automatically just by knocking out the limb. Okay. So in the Brisa. Let's see, he hits him on his eye and he blinds him. <clears throat> he didn't actually take out a limb. He just blinded him because of the blow, the uh, the injury. He hits him on his ear. He makes him deaf. But that's good enough. The slave goes free. Now here it appears. He doesn't hit him actually on the eye. He hits him on the wall. Hits the wall. And it, somehow the shock of some sort, the loud noise and everything, makes him blind. Um, he bangs on the wall. That's right next to his ear. Now we can't hear. That's already not considered a direct injury, and the slave doesn't go free. Umara has a question. Umar of Shaman Ravashi. Shaman says to Ravashi, You're telling me that sound is nothing. You're just making it like sound doesn't is not considered a direct injury. But but we have this Gemara and Baba Kama. Rami Bar Yecheskel taught. There's a discussion in uh, in the Gemara, something called Shreiras. Shreiras are like the um, a, a slightly indirect um, damage would be if the, the pebbles that shoot out from under the animal's foot, if that causes damage. Is that considered direct, uh -huh. indirect? There's a discussion about that. Anyway, the rule is that yeah, if it's indirect, then you would only pay if it this actually not that if it's indirect, there's a machlekes what the rule is by that. It's machlekes simchas and the rabbanon. Simchas holds that it's nezek shalim and the rabbanon hold that it's chatsi nezek by this type of damage. We're saying now that if it if a if a chicken puts its head inside a, a glass vase or some sort of vessel, decides to you know a rooster decides to make its noises in there and from the sound, the high pitch. Um, it breaks the uh, breaks the glass. Yeah, the sound breaks the glass. So, um, so uh, the the first opinion over here says Mishal Nesik Shalim. You have to pay damages, which means that the sound is considered a direct damage, or at least enough of a damage that it's considered uh, that you would have to pay for it. For the well, the owner of the rooster. <laughs> here we're talking about when you're in Baba Kami, You talk about when your money. When your objects cause damage, your animals, your things yeah. cause damage. You're responsible. You're, you're, you're responsible for that. Yosef, how many bear this discussion if it's because you own it or if it's because you were supposed to watch it? Amri Rav Yosef, Amri Bey Rav. Rav Yosef says in the name of the Yeshiva Rav, Suf, Sus, a horse. Shetzana, Shetzana. What does that mean, Shetzana? What do you have in your English? Nade. Nade, is that the word? The Chamar Shania. A uh, donkey that braid, is that the word? Braid. Also named? The horse days. Uh, donkey, donkey braids. The shevra kalim, and the broke vessels. The tayhabayas inside the house. Mishalm chatzinezek, you have to pay half price. Now, this is not an argument. This is not a difference between a, a horse and a chicken. This is a difference between sumchus and the rabbanon. That over the rabbanon hold that it's chatzinezek. So, what are, you, what are you telling me that making noises is nothing? You have to pay for it when damages. Amalei, so Ravashi responded, Shani Yodam, Kivan the Bardasu, Iumavas Nafshay. The difference is not uh, between noise and something else. The difference is between if it was a person that heard the noise or if it was an animal that heard the noise. But there it was vessels. 
But over here, it's a person, and here, here's the noise. Why? Kidditanya was taught in a brisa. Mavis has Someone scares his friend. But does he scare him? He like goes boo very loudly. Even though it made him deaf, but he's exempt from paying in court, but he's obligated to pay by the heavenly court. Kate said, what would be a case? He blows in his ear, he makes him deaf. But if he grabs him, then he's going to be chayab. Okay. So what we're seeing now is that the, um, when, the how frightened the person, we're talking about that he became deaf because of the fright that came along with the sound. How frightened a person gets has to do with his resistance to that. You know, if he he can get more, depends. If he's very, very relaxed, he won't get frightened. If he's very uptight, then he's going to get even more frightened. So it's really himself that causes that fright. It's not, it's not, um, it's not what really what the person's doing because it is his involvement. So that uh, that makes him wow. so Back to our case, if you bang on the wall, makes the slave deaf, that, that's up to the slave how frightened he gets. It's not, it's not like if you hit him. If you hit him, then uh, he goes free automatically. But if you bang on the wall, it makes a big noise, he goes deaf, that's not counted. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Well, if he touches him, it's more responsible. He hits him on his eye and is, now he needs glasses. Al Shinai, he hits him on his tooth, but now he has a loose tooth. He can't eat our apples, but he can eat other stuff. If he can still use it, then the slave doesn't go free. But if he can't use it anymore, then the slave would go free. There's another Brysa. Can you pronounce that? Let's say he had a weak eye anyway. He needed had thick glasses even before you started. And then he bangs him on the eye. Shina in Aduda, he had a, uh, a loose tooth, the Ipila, and he knocked it out. He used to tie a string to the door. And... If you were able to use the tooth in the eye beforehand, now he made him blind, now he lost his tooth. But if you weren't able to use it anyway, then that was not considered anything significant. Utsricha, we needed both of these cases. If you want only one, if you would have said the first case, we are just weakened his eyesight, weakened his tooth. We would say, why over there uh, is that necessary? Because over there he saw, he actually saw well before. But now it's now it's uh, now and now it's weak. But to say that um, uh, when it's originally weak, we would say that that's nothing. And if we would only say when it's originally weak, Mishum de Samuel Agamri, over here it's really something because now you made him totally blind and totally knocked it out. I will hustle by Samuel Agamri, but over there you didn't make him totally blind, you just weakened it. Emolai, we would say no, so it's necessary to teach us those halachas. Tan Rabbanu, start in the Bryce Rishi, Rabbi Rafi, let's say the master is a doctor. Vamalai, and the slave tells him, Likhalai, Enai Vesama. He says, Can you please um, heal my eye? But he ends up blind again. Amalek could mean the master told him, I'm going to heal your eye. He puts on this potion, ends up blinding him. He says, I'm going to um, take out a cavity. Okay. And uh, he ends up taking out the whole tooth. So, Sichik, right? Sichik, he laughs at the master and he goes free because he's, he's free. Okay. Shim Megam Leal says, uh, he doesn't go free. It's only if he does it in this destructive way. He has to intend to, to be destructive. Rabbanan, what did the Rabbanan do with this Pasuk? This was malpractice, right? But this wasn't intentional. What did they do with it? They use it to exempt something else. It says, there's a b'raiser, he tried to help deliver the baby of his slave. And what he did was he put his hands, he used like uh, tools or what are they called, forceps or something. Uh, yeah. He put his hand inside to pull the baby out, but he ended up putting his finger in the baby's eye. The uh, Sima he blinded the baby. So he's potter, he's exempt. My time, he didn't do that intentionally. He was intending to help to give birth. You have to have at least intention 
for the eye. He didn't even intend for the eye. He was intending to help to help her give birth. Be'idach, what does Reb Shimon ben Gamliel say? How do you know that over there you're exempt as well? It says, Mushchas, Shachas, Anafka. I guess there's an extra letter in that in that word. Nivashiches, Shachas, Nivashiches, Shachas. What does that passage actually say? Nivashiches. So it's the Vav of Shachas. Be'idach, and the Rabbanan, Shachas, Shachas, Alei Darish. They don't learn from that. I think it's not the Vav. It's the it's the Shachas, it's the Hey. What happens when the slave holds like the rabbana and the master holds like the rabbana? Ah, Kimli. Oh, yeah, that's a good. Levi's asking if the slave says Kimli like the rabbana. I paskin like the rabbana or whatever. Uh, well, not. He would say I paskin. Yeah, something like that. I'm Rav Sheshes. Rav Sheshes says, Risha, Let's see, he was blind anyway, but the master just removed the eye. Every day, he goes free. My time, I'm a chusraver, and now he's missing a limb. The, there's the function of the limb, and now is also missing the actual limb. And this was actually taught in a brisa. Thomas Vizachus Bebehema, Bein Thomas Vizachus Baifus. When it talks about birds, it says that it doesn't need to be a male or a female. It also doesn't need to ha- not have a blemish. Yachali of Shagapa Venachta But even if it's missing a wing or it's dried up, or if a foot is missing or its eye is, is uh, taken out, Amalaymer Minaif like a life. Over there, it's considered missing a limb. Even though it's not, con- even though blemishes don't apply, but a full limb does apply. If let's say he had an extra finger and the master cut it off, the slave goes free. That would only be if it was in line with the other fingers. So he had a sixth finger, then it would go free. But if it was poking out from uh, from his palm or from the back of his hand, then he won't go free for that. That would not considered an extra finger. Okay, let's leave it over here.